So I, I like to move around, and um, depending on how, how this, this goes today, I'll, I'll probably spend a little bit of time over there kind of navigating the slides, because the reality is that preparing a pitch deck is, is a big topic you know, for entrepreneurs. Um, you, it, it's the vehicle through which you acquire resources to, to run your company, and so uh, you, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time uh, on, on your pitch deck uh, over the period of time you're running your company, and there's a lot that goes into it, and I'm not sure that in, in, in a one hour lunch session we can, we can get through it all. So what I want to do is just try to make this as tailored to what you're specifically interested in um, as possible, okay? So do we have um, anybody raising money in the room right now? Okay? Yes. All right, and uh, if you don't mind, just help me out. What sort of stage are we at? Are we sort of uh, raising at the seed level? Anybody at the seed? Okay. Any anybody post seed that might be looking to raise like an A round? Okay. All right. So, sort of seed level. Pre seed. Pre seed and seed. Okay. So so um, that, that that helps me understand um, where where to focus. So, is anybody in the room currently not working on a pitch deck? Okay, so, so everybody is sort of working on a pitch deck, looking, looking at raising money. That, that, that's awesome. Okay, so um, anybody prepared a pitch deck before? Okay, all right. So we've got some, some experience in the room that, uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll draw on. Okay, so. All right, so, so what I want to do is, is, is just start by, um, I'll stand over here so I'm not blocking any screens, but to just start by just, just really defining what a pitch deck is, okay? Because, uh, you know, the term is used so often in entrepreneurial circles, and you know, just based on my experience, I think it's helpful to sort of understand what, what, what the point of a pitch deck is and what it's not, okay? So the pitch deck, is designed to introduce potential investors to your business, all right? Uh, the primary goal is to get a potential investor interested enough to set a meeting so you can pitch them, okay? It's, it's really not to communicate everything about your business ahead of time. It's to get them interested just enough so you can uh, set a meeting to discuss further. Um, in my experience, it needs to tell a compelling story as a, as a standalone document, which is tricky because you don't want to load it up with a ton of detail, right? So there's a high level, sequential, very, very clear story that you're telling with your pitch deck as a standalone document. And then, uh, obviously, it needs to be easy enough for someone who's not an expert in your field to be able to make it through, uh, so short and easy to follow. Um, it needs to stand alone when read, but then you'll know what sort of color you want to add when you are actually in the room for a meeting. And fundamentally, what you're trying to do with your pitch deck is to drive belief, right? You're putting a plan in front of a potential investor, and you want to be able to drive belief in the sense that this plan is clear, it's easy to follow, um, but it flows in a way that helps a potential investor really believe that it's a credible plan, you have what it takes to execute and deliver on the plan. I also think it's, an, it's important for driving belief for yourself. Uh, there's been many times when I put a pitch deck together and looked at it and thought, you know, there, there are huge gaps here, right? There, there are just some things that don't quite add up at this point in time. So I've used my pitch deck as a, as a strategic tool that I come back to from time to time, uh, primarily because it is a plan, it addresses the various aspects of, of your business, and you can use it essentially as a strategic inventory for taking stock of, of where you are. So what I've done today is I've seen a ton of pitch decks. I've made, made, a, made a lot myself. 
Um, and what I tried to do was sort of look at various examples out there just to make sure that we can have a conversation about you know, what are the typical kinds of things that should go in a pitch deck. And then what I want to do is, based on your interest, dive into some, some sections that um, you know, can inform our discussion for the rest of our time. Okay? So I think there's a process involved in pitching. Okay? The whole idea behind pitching is you have a vision for a business. Uh, something you're looking to realize. And there's a gap between where you are today, the vision that you have, and at some point in the future where that vision is going to be realized. Now, that gap, what takes you from vision to vision realized are resources, right? Capital. That's where fundraising comes in. But you also uh, need to be able to convince other people to uh, buy into your vision. And, and so uh, you, need, you need resources to be able to do that. And again, the difference between vision and vision realized is, is a lot of belief. Belief on your part, but also being able to drive belief, uh, not just among investors, but all stakeholders that uh, come around your business as you grow. Okay. So what are, the, what, are the, what are the parts of the pitching process? I think in my experience, there are at least three parts. There's a content preparation piece, which is essentially preparing to communicate about various aspects of your business. Okay? These are the things that actually go into your pitch deck. Then you have the actual crafting of the pitch deck and the story that um, you're going to be articulating uh, to tell people about, about your business. And then there's that, the actual delivery of the pitch deck in the Q&A, okay? So getting ready to be good in the room, uh, answering a very, very broad set of questions that might come up about your pitch deck. In my experience, that's where a potential investor really gets to understand how much you know about, about your business, um, and can they actually trust your understanding of the opportunity enough to believe that you will ultimately execute, okay? So, I, I mean, I think each of these are, could, could be workshops in their own right. Um, so we want, we're not gonna have a lot of time to sort of focus on the content preparation and the delivery and Q&A piece. Uh, we can talk about that offline if you're, if you're interested. Uh, so, but what I'm going to focus on today is, is primarily the pitch deck, the elements of the pitch deck itself, and, and maybe even uh, just focus on some subsets of, of, of that uh, set of elements, okay? So, at a very high level, um, here are the most common elements you'll see in a pitch deck. And I think whether you're talking about pre-seed or you're talking about raising an E or an F round, uh, there, these, these items are typically ones you want to focus on. You want to be able to talk about what is the purpose of your business? Like why, why do you exist? And how do you, what is the key problem that you're actually solving out in the marketplace? What is your solution? And what is it about now that makes your particular solution and how it addresses the problem in the marketplace really unique and position for some kind of competitive advantage? What's the market size? How, how big is the opportunity? Are there are competitors out there. Um, what product are you going to use to, to meet the need in the marketplace? How are you going to generate revenue with that product? So that's your business model. And what kind of traction do you have at this point in time? Who's the team that's going to make it happen? And then this is the actual pitch. What are you asking for? Okay, so, so what I've done here is I have tried to uh, think through, you know, based on a range of decks that I've seen, a range of companies that I've worked with, my own experience, where are there differences between, um, you know, a pre-seed or seed deck and, you know, let's say a, 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 an early um, post-seed round, like an A or a B round. So I think that the company purpose, um, you know, largely 
it is essentially the same. It's, it, it's, it's a single declar de declarative sentence that describes what your business is all about. The problem definition is, is, is also can be very similar. It's, it's describing the customer's pain, um, you know, what, what current solutions exist and why are those solutions inadequate. Now, this is where I think, depending on where you are in your, in your business, things can look a little bit different, okay? So, for the solution that you bring, I think definitely, most commonly, what people are looking for at, let's say, the post-seed stage is, what's your value proposition and how does your solution make the, the customer's life better? But at the point when you're sort of post-seed, people are looking for, how is this product being received in the marketplace? Have you done some field trials? How does it perform? What kind of case studies do you have? Now, at the pre-seed and seed level, um, it, it can be different, right? If you're a more capital-intensive company, you're going to raise a lot of rounds before sometimes you get to the point where you, you have case studies. But if you're a software company, for example, then um, you, know, you may actually already be at sort of a post-seed case studies kind of level, but you're raising a, a, a pre-seed round. But, but sort of to split the difference here, um, what you're looking at here is really the value proposition, a description of how your solution makes the customer's life better. Why now? Okay, so this, again, especially at the pre-seed level, you're not going to have a ton of traction commonly to talk about, but this is where you show the investor your understanding of the dynamics of the marketplace, right? That's where the opportunities are. So the more you can show a real command of what's happening in the marketplace by showing where your solution fits in, its, in historical trends um, and what trends make your solution possible, um, you know, you're beginning to show that you can actually create value. And at the point you're at the post-seed level, uh, you should not only be able to talk about these trends, but you should already have some evidence, right, that what you have to offer confirms that the timing is, is good. Um, market size, uh, these are the typical breakdown. You've got your total addressable market, your serviceable addressable market, and your serviceable obtainable market. Um, at the earlier level, though, uh, I think it can show a lot of savviness to dig deeper into this and show a potential investor that you've done a lot of customer discovery work, right? You understand uh, who your customer is, you have a defined set of personas that you are catering to, and you understand roughly, um, you know, within a uh, a subset of a segment, for example, how many potential customers are defined by that persona. Um, an understanding of what their willingness to pay is. And you, you could very, very credibly say, over some period of time, you're gonna be at some level of, of revenue growth, right? So, uh, TAM, SAM, and SOM, you know, the serviceable, obtainable market begins to sort of point to what your market share is, at a post-seed level, you're going to have more of a sense for that. At a pre-seed level, it's, it's about focus, right? Uh, investors still want to see how big the opportunity is going to be, but ultimately, if you can show that, yes, this is a huge opportunity, but we're, we're selecting the right early adopters, we understand their profiles, we understand what makes them an ideal customer for us at this point in time, we understand what their willingness to pay is, you're going to have a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of interest. Competition um, under show an understanding of the competitive landscape and your competitive positioning. Uh, at a later stage, you're listing key competitors and you're comparing your competitive advantages. At the product, uh, you know, for the product at the pre-seed seed level, typically you might not actually have a product out yet. Again, varies uh, from business to business, but that, that's commonly the case. So what you're looking at here is more of a conversion of your technology platform to initial products, 
okay? And if you're starting to get some feedback from the marketplace, being able to talk about what that is is, is going to be helpful. Post seed, if you already have products, you could um, really dig into understanding how those products are being received in the marketplace and how you're tooling your product development roadmap to take advantage of new gaps that you might be uncovering in the marketplace because you're now engaging with, with customers. The business model, um, at the pre-seed seed stage, it's okay to outline potential business models. Um, depending on how early you are, um, I think it's helpful to say, this is what we think our business model is going to be, this is why we think it's going to work, but we're open to other business models, okay? At the post-seed stage, you already have a business model that is giving you some data. It may not be perfect, but it gives you a baseline from which you can begin to, to retool. So financials or traction. Um, so at the post-seed stage, typically you have some revenue, you're showing some revenue growth, you may be able to begin to identify a path to breaking even, how you can things you can actually do to increase your margins, for example, is what investors are looking for at that stage. Um, at the pre-seed seed stage, summarizing your customer discovery, what you've learned in that process, um, identifying the personas, the willingness to pay, as I mentioned earlier, any sort of preliminary sales, uh, preliminary revenue, uh, some level of adoption, Okay, anything you can quantify at this level is, is the traction that is, that is typically uh, important at this stage. And then, of course, with the team, you want to be able to talk about your founders, your management team, key advisors, and your board of directors to the degree that uh, that broader team outside of your set of founders is going to lend you some credibility that you might not have early on in, 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 in your fundraising efforts. And then, and then finally, your ask, or the terms of your raise, okay? So what is the target raise? What is the valuation that you're looking to raise at? And um, how will you use your, your funds, okay? So I've sort of highlighted where things differ here. Some of these items are fairly straightforward, so you don't want to spend a ton of time going through each of these if it's not going to be of interest. So, I'm gonna turn it over to you and just sort of see, you know, what, what of these, let's just take some, some suggestions here, what of these would you like to dig into a little bit more that would add more value to you? Yeah, so they, whenever I do a pitch like in the competitions, they always talk about mentioning the competition and it's usually harder to talk about the competition uh, while undermining yourself. Like, you can talk about them but you also want to make your, your product shine. So how do you navigate that? Let's say you have, you are doing something better than your competition, but it is not like leaps, bounds of leaps better, I'd say. Maybe you're maybe just doing something differently, but you also want to make sure that you acknowledge that there is some competition that exists. So how can you navigate mentioning the competition and making sure that you also come out shining? Yeah. yeah. So we'll, let's, let's, let's talk about competition, that's one. I'll, I'll take that as, as, as an option and, and we'll, we'll, we'll dig into it here. We, we, we could probably start there. Are there other? Business model. Business model, okay. So competition, business model. Market size, particularly when you're in a green field. Okay. Space that you don't see much by way, of, I mean, going back to competition. Mm -hmm. Don't really see somebody who's doing the same thing. Okay. A lot of people doing quite different things that aren't really what we're... Right, okay, so um, competition, market size, business model. Um, curious about at the great even. Does anyone actually achieve that not? I mean, given that the idea we kind of see is people more gross, mm -hmm. is it actually we can break even or it's that? Is it better to be honest about it and say we're not actually going above break even if you want to show more money, more so we're going to spend more money? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So 
This is turning into a Q&A, which is okay. No, 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 it's completely fine. But I want to I want to be responsive uh, to the different questions. So so let's do that. Uh, I, you might have to remind me of it, but let's just go ahead and, and, and answer the questions, okay? So your your question was about how to talk about competition, right? Uh, okay. So let me see uh, if I can find one of my slides here. Um, So, um, I put up Cash Energy's uh, slide up here because I think this is exactly a good example of how to show a good understanding of the marketplace, right? Your ability to be a leader in the market's marketplace, even though you're just starting out, by showing a potential investor or teaching them something that they may not otherwise have known, right? So this is something I have, you know, some of our own slides from Autonomic Materials uh, where, we've, where we've done something similar. But here, the cash is working on um, a long uh, storage energy uh, uh, solutions. And, you know, you see the positioning that, that's done here in terms of uh, the cost versus the, uh, the duration of storage. The thing that is counterintuitive, and it took me a little bit of time to understand this, is the psychology of an investor, right? It's odd, right? Because on the one hand, you know, everything we've learned in, in economics tells us that, okay, if I'm forced to market, I have a period of time uh, in which to leverage some sort of uh, monopoly, right? So, so, so from, an, from an entrepreneur's perspective, it seems like it's a good thing if a market is um, new, there are not really any, any, any obvious competitors in there. But typically what happens is that investors look at that and say, I wonder why there are no other competitors there, right? Maybe, maybe it's not as interesting, right? So even if you don't think that there are direct competitors, Right? You want to create a landscape that will help you actually position yourself relative to where the incumbents are and show how you're differentiated, right? So I've made a lot of two by two matrices in my time. This is a, a good example of that, where you can uh, acknowledge that there are uh, in, you know, other competitive companies out there potentially working on the same things, but show where you're highly differentiated, right? So you can see here, hey, we can, we can store energy for a longer period of time and we cost less. What I like, what I really like that um, uh, Cash Energy did too is this one. Now this will get an investor's attention, right? Is not only um, do we have that sort of uh, competitive positioning from a market standpoint, here's positioning in terms of capital that's actually required. Okay? So from an investor's perspective, I'm looking at this and thinking, you know, this, this technology is really well positioned, but then beyond that, compared to all of the other uh, competitive products or technologies that are out there, it is actually much less capital intensive in a landscape that is very highly very, very highly capital intensive, right? So, so this really jumps out as something that is really attractive, okay? Carol, do you think they want to see other venture-backed companies considering the low value, pitch book of the low valuation, the low around, is it beneficial in your mind and you're showing other institutional investors or in the space? I do. They want to be part of the action? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely do. This is, this is something that was always counterintuitive for me. I do think that um, to, to, to a large extent, there's a sweet spot, right? You don't want it to be too crowded a space, but you also want to be in a space um, 
that helps investors understand that this is a this is a problem that's worth solving. Some of their competitors, other other investors, are already on board, um, and it's an opportunity to back somebody who's doing something new and interesting in that space. Okay. Okay. On the, on the competition point, if you're making kind of modernization plays, is it advisable to try to illustrate, you know, like status quo as a competitor? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There, there are always going to be incumbents, right? The, the solution, the, the problem is being addressed in some way um, in, in, in the marketplace. And I think being smart about how you lay out the, um, how you lay out the, the, the competitive landscape is, is interesting for investors. So let, let me show you, uh, I left my clicker over there, but. So, so here's, here's an example of, of how we did it at Autonomic Materials. So there, there are two ways to think about competitors for what we do. So we make, um, at this point, we basically make higher performing protective solutions for metals, coating, sealants, adhesives. Um, one way to look at competition for us, which is, which is a simpler way to look at it, is who else is working on something similar to self-healing technology out there? And where are they in, in that process of bringing a, a, a product to market or developing the technology, right? So we, we can put a competitive landscape together like this. Um, but we can also put one together that looks like this, where we're actually comparing ourselves to incumbent codings in the marketplace. Right, because there are coatings in the marketplace currently. They're not self-healing, but in many instances, there are a number of coatings that are really, really high performing in the marketplace. But we try to actually show where we're gonna position ourselves by focusing on a lower volatile organic compound coating um, that also delivers really high performance, right? And so we can take all this data that is out there and actually map it on a uh, on a matrix and show why we are highly differentiated, particularly from the standpoint of investors looking to invest in something that is uh, greener and more environmentally friendly. Okay, so it's really all in relation to your specific competitive dynamic, right, and, and who your investor is, right? Uh, if I was raising money from a corporate VC for one of the coding companies, uh, I will probably show them this one. If I'm raising money from an impact fund that's interested in lowering CO2 impact, i show them this one, right? So, so it's about understanding the, the, the dynamic enough to be able to show these kinds of positioning differences, okay? Is there a question? Yeah, can you go back to my slide? Yeah. This one? Yeah, I think that that is more a function of um, where you are in the evolution of your business, right? By the time you get to, you know, a, a, a Series B round, for example, you're going to have so much more data, not just about how your business is performing, but about the competition. I think at the seed stage, this is awesome. Okay. All right, so there are a few other questions over here um, or, or interests in, in areas to focus on that um, that I want to come back to. Right, business model. You want to talk about, about business model. So let me see here. Um, let's go through this real quick. Okay. All right, so, so what, what, what is the business model? It describes how the business will make money. I think the easiest way, particularly for, for those of us with more uh, engineering and science backgrounds, is to focus on the, on the unit economics, right? If you, if you can really understand that, and it's never too early to start thinking about this because, you know, what's the status quo right now? How do you talk about yourself in light of competition? If the status quo is people do it manually. 
people just throw more people at the problem. There's no real company solving the problem. Yeah. So um, that's that's your competition. Okay. It, it's completely fine to outline that as your competition. Um, what I would be looking for is some understanding of emerging ways of solving that problem, even if they don't have a level of um, you know, market maturity yet. Because okay? what you don't want is to say you don't have competition and for your investor to very quickly through a, you know, a series of searches find that you do have competition, right? So investing the time in, again, making some kind of matrix where you teach the investor about the marketplace and show them where you're positioned, uh, I think is well worthwhile because it's another way you can also keep track of your competition. Someone pops up, you know, you're going to get asked about it, about it, so go ahead and put them on your positioning map uh, so you can kind of see where they are uh, relative to, to where you are. All right, what else do we want to talk about um, as far as the pitch deck goes? What haven't we covered yet? Where would you like to see some more examples? How would you like the investor to know of your customer's value or like how much revenue they're going to bring? How do you tell, tell your investor that your customer's not going to buy a How is that? What is that? Okay, so you're asking how to calculate customer lifetime value? How do you like pitch that to the investor? Okay, so do you have an example by any chance? Like, so if you, let's say you're, you're working on something and you've actually determined what the customer lifetime value is, can you, can you articulate the duration, first of all, um, of time that that, Customer is going to be a customer, and um, you know how how much they would spend on your product over that period of time. Yeah. So if you can do that, then that goes to the the business model, right? So you have hopefully you have a a type of customer, not just one customer, right? So you can say I've got. 20 of these kinds of customers, the average lifetime value is 10 years. And on an annual basis over those 10 years, they're going to spend this much. And it's the most straightforward way to actually put a projection together. It can be, it can be difficult to do that for a lot of businesses. Uh, but if you have that, that's a great place to be, right? Because your projections have less uncertainty in them. If you really believe, believe those numbers, they have less uncertainty in them. And so when you go to raise a seed and you say, you know, I've got, I'm projecting, you know, three million in revenue next year based on, you know, these number of customers, this customer lifetime, this average revenue uh, per year over that lifetime, then, if you come back and you hit 60, 70% of that, you're in really good shape to raise your next round, right? So, so that's, that's the way to do it if you have those numbers. You're also, you want to make sure you have the retention rate data that's based on right. business, customer acquisition costs, things like that, that's yep. not just revenue, it's all the... Yeah, there's, there's, there's churn, there's, you know, it is, you know, to, to start with the revenue is great. Right. Especially if you're, if you are a, a, a seed round company. Let's just say you don't have, it, but you do have a client and that you have that value over over a certain period of time. You try to pitch that as a seller. All right, I, I'm going to need you to say that one more time so I can understand. So you don't have those numbers. Or, 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 or the, you, you have a relation on how much the customer will produce over that period of time. But you don't have So you, what is the prediction based on that? Uh, the business model. How uh, the business functions and 
how do you see your customer using this product? Yeah. Would you have any? So, so if you have a model, right, which is kind of what you're what you're talking about, uh, I would say. If you, depending on your business, of course, but if you can get close to beginning to show how some actuals track relative to that model, that's what you need to do to make it very compelling. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, if you're, if that's built on some really good, solid uh, customer discovery effort, uh, and you have a model, um, you know, that's what I'd be taking. But your model, you know. If you can model revenue growth, right, uh, that way, you should be able to model, uh, you know, customer acquisition costs and churn um, and and things like that. Because, you know, to, to the point Laura was making, you you're just going to be much more credible to to show that you know, okay, this model is great. Um, you know, but I can also model the customer acquisition. I can model my costs essentially, so that people can see that it's not. You know, you, you, you can generate the revenue, but you're not doing it at, a, at an acquisition cost that's substantially greater than the revenue you're ultimately going to generate. So, so yeah. I mean, I think putting those two together, but then also if you can start getting some early actuals into that model, it's going to be much more credible. You mentioned credibility in like, you know, pre seed seed stage. Understanding that basically the ten point six up there of the mm -hmm. revenue model, it's like you know, I don't have I don't have actual hard data to, to confirm that. It's mostly done through some customer discovery. Yeah. And I don't know if this is maybe what you're asking, but like what is it if in the investor shoes, what kind of information are you wanting us to put forth from it? Customer discovery standpoint, I think to say, I think this is how much, how much, you know, that that driver of revenue will be, uh, even though I don't have, we haven't started yet, we have, we don't have a year's worth of data under our belt. How do I hit that credibility you know, to say, yeah, I think we're going to do you know, a thousand widgets in, in sales or something? Yeah. So, you know, an important part of customer discovery is. Um, is basically either well, you, you ultimately want to have both, right? You you want because because what what investors would look for are you saying okay, you know, I'm basing my model on on a hundred customers. Here are ten that I've already said if I can deliver on these specs, they'll they'll purchase my 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 product. And here's their profile, and here's why these other ninety. Are similar to these ten. So, like quotes in the deck. From quotes from in the deck, letters uh, that that people sign that say, "Yep, you know, yeah, you, you can help them with that, of course." But uh, that say, you know, if, if if this meets these specifications and can deliver in this way, I'm certainly interested in purchasing the product. That's what most companies have at the early stage, and if you can manage to, you know. Whether it's a pilot or something, you know, push one or two of them to actually pay for something, even more credible. Sure. Real quick. Yeah. I was just on a call with a VC last week, and I asked her this very question. She was saying, "You've got to do five-year projections." And I'm like, "I can't do a five-year projection because I don't have paying customers." She just said, "It doesn't matter. We know that your projections are going to be wrong." <laughs> What matters is that we, you know, which levers, and what what are the assumptions that are put into that model, so that you can say, if these assumptions hold true, this is what it's going to look like. Yeah. If those assumptions change, it's going to change the whole model. So it's not so much we we know that our guesses are going to be wrong. Everyone knows that our guesses are wrong. So long as we have the right assumptions made, put into those guesses, that's enough. At least that's what she said to me. She's like, that's enough for me to make the decision, yes or no. As long as I know, you know which levers are the most important ones to pull. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think, I think again, 
coming back to the concept of belief, right? It, it's, it's do you know what's going on in the marketplace? That, that's what you're trying to convince them of. And let's face it, you know, some of those assumptions are going to end up being wrong. Um, but if your thinking is logical and you can convince them that it is, that's, that's, that's what matters ultimately. Because the expectation is that if you learn that a certain assumption is wrong, that you, you will make the necessary adjustments. So if you're in the drug discovery realm, business for humans and animals, the exit is obviously a position by nature. Mm -hmm. How does the depth change if that's the end goal is it or not? I don't think the deck itself changes. Actually, what's not in here, I realized that as you asked that question, is, um, you know, usually you would have like an exit strategy inside in your deck. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, as far as pharmaceuticals, drug discovery type businesses is, is concerned, people understand, you know, typically what the, what the exit is going to look like. But they still want to see... <coughs> Uh, you know, maybe maybe your traction is not so much about about revenue, right? But it's about um, you know, it's about um, product development. It's about FDA approval. You know, right? The, you, you will tailor your traction to the business and your and your ultimate exit. Intellectual property. You know, yeah. In one of the slides, you have the behind the story. What is the makeup of that story? Because uh, I have heard some stories, some people would make up a story just to get their children to invest. Like the founder of eBay yeah. wanted to help their girlfriend sell some stuff, but actually the story was not true. So, <laughs> how? I wouldn't advise that. What, <laughs> what, what, what is the makeup of the story? And is it advisable to make a fictitious story? I wouldn't. I mean, I think so. You know, typically, sometimes you, you, you have founders um, that articulate some sort of origin story, right? Like, where, where did the idea for the business come from? Or, you know, what, what problem you were trying to solve and um, that, that caused you to think, hey, we should really consider starting a business around this. And the reason that that's important is, I mean, if you think about it from the perspective of an investor who's seeing, who might have, I don't know, I've seen some crazy numbers, uh, they may go through 30 pitch decks a day, right? Um, that's why that one concise sentence in the beginning that talks about what your business is about is so important, because just imagine somebody opens up you know, an email, your deck is attached, this is the first thing they see, that's what determines whether they're gonna, they're gonna read the rest of it, right? Uh, so the more compelling that is, the more evocative that is, uh, the more likely it is that they're gonna read the rest of it and then, um, and then bring you in. Now when you, when, or if, you, if you're in a, on a Zoom call or something like that and you're talking to them, the same thing is true. They, they may talk to, you know, six, seven entrepreneurs in, in, in one day, potentially. So the reason these stories matter is, you know, all the stuff that we're talking about is, is sort of um, the next level that you get to if someone is genuinely interested in you as a person, your story, and the story of your business. Right? So it, 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 it can then tend to boil down to you know, some, some actual connection you know, at, at a human level. Something that's going to cause that VC, after talking to you, to walk out, see their partner in the hallway and say, I just met this guy and he's just unbelievably interesting. Right? That, that's why people do that. But you also have to be authentic because it falls apart very quickly if you're not. Right? So, we all have those stories. We may have to, you know, think about it a bit. But the, the whole idea there is about fostering a level of connection that um, you know might might help someone remember you and, and what you're trying to do. But I definitely wouldn't advise 
making it up because you know it falls apart. So, in everything else we do, we we we, iter we tend to iterate, mm -hmm. right? There's a very clear signal of something has failed, did not work, changed, tried yep. again. How do you iterate on the deck? Like, you know, we, if I pitch 30 times and I've heard 30 VCs, like, it's great. You're just a bit early, right? Like, how do I? <laughs> How do I get signal out of that, or get signal out of the VC conversation to know, okay, this didn't resonate, or I need to change how I'm delivering this? That this seems like it's really hard. Yeah, that, that that's a really good question because the easy, easy answer to that is 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 you know you're always iterating on your deck. Uh, that's the easy answer to that. Um, I tweak my deck. Sometimes even in between, you know, I might send it to someone, right? And in preparation for that conversation, something changes. A new purchase order comes in from, you know, a potential uh, for, from a customer that, that's a huge name, right? Like, so, so I'm always, I'm always, always tweaking it. Um, but I think that on some level, uh, you have to treat your pitches almost like a customer discovery effort where you ask some questions as well along the way, right? So assuming that you've done all of your diligence, you know, okay, this investor invests in this, in the space that I'm in, they invest in companies at the stage that I'm in, then, um, you know, I would be trying to ask some questions to just try to understand if it doesn't look like something is resonating, why not? And a lot of times, even when VCs, not all of them do this, but if you're pitching 30, I, I would be willing to bet that three would. Um, a lot of times, some of them would be willing to say, to give you a little bit more than you're just early, if you ask. You know, I understand you said we're, we're early, but you know, what, what sort of stage would you like to see us? Be, you know, you, and when you say early, are you talking customer traction, product development, like making it a little bit more specific so that you can get some some better feedback might be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Arthur. One question. Yeah. Following on that, so I get to see anything like message, you are doing. So is it just so I'm just gonna do is like like in the very first meeting, like I'm feeling that it's not gonna go well. I'd be like, if you guys do not invest, can you tell me why? Yeah, okay. that, that's entirely fine. Yeah, like, can you give me like two reasons why you did not invest? Yeah. Like it's short email follow-up. Yeah, and, and, and what's your experience with that? Do you, do you usually get some up, feedback? Yeah, so we can turn yeah. on. Like, yeah. Uh, but even in the call, sometimes I just ask, like, what exactly would you want to see from me? Uh, maybe in a year if you think I'm early? Yeah. Or you could invest? Yeah. That, that, is, that is really valuable data. Yep, exactly right. So how are we doing with time? Okay, it looks like we're almost done. But uh, any other, any other, go ahead <clears throat> from, from the perspective of, you know, you, you, you get the pitch deck, it's great, and you're trying to get this over to your potential investor. What are some of the basic, I guess, uh, customs or, or nice things to do in terms of naming, file size, uh, how to submit uh, those types of things, just some of the basics. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, um, it's nice when you can actually, when you, you know, if it's, it's nice when it's a warm lead, right? Like, you know, they, they're, you've been introduced, you're sending your deck, then you can just, you can just send it by email. And, um, you know, typically, you know, we would just have something like, Auto, autonomic materials intro as the naming or autonomic materials pitch deck or AMI pitch deck, right? So they know, know it's yours. Um, and, then, and then beyond that, um, you know, I think if, it, if, it's a, if it's a file size, that you, 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 you almost always are sending these uh, as a PDF, by the way. Um, so that, that typically will allow you to, to put that in a, in a file size that, uh, that makes sense. Um, you obviously want to be able to email it. Um, so I mean, I think if you're, t if you're 20 megabytes or less, you're probably okay. Um, but yes, if it's a, if it's a PDF, 
that that's always going to be good because you know things will will show up exactly the way you intended them to, um, and then of course you'll have your uh, uh, your your actual PowerPoint or keynote or, or whatever or whatever you're using when you present, especially if you you know have some demos and things like that you want to show. If the deck actually shows. Uh, or has a comment that, uh, that that helps them think that okay, there's there could be an actual demo here, um, in a pick you may pick your interest too to, to follow up just to see what you're working on. If you submit to them, if you pitch to them, and they say no to you, they actually give you a whole ecosystem of materials. Here's why you were wrong, or not a good fit for us too early, whatever that might be. They give a whole slew of education just to help you figure out how to get to where they would have liked to see you. Yeah, that's helpful. I think I think you see more and more of that now, so that's good. It kind of helps with their brand as well. You know, you're much more likely to pitch them again or tell other people to pitch them if, if they do that. So. All right, well, this has been fun. I appreciate you guys coming. Um, if you, thank you.